Hello everyone, it's that time of the week where we run through the week's big news in Azeroth. And the biggest this week is an update on 1026 from executive producer Holly Longdale. This update actually has some pretty huge implications for how the remainder of Dragonflight will play out that I'm going to dive into in this week's episode. So do stay around for that, but before we get into it, that's not the only surprises we've had this week. Now, the Lunar Festival holiday event is now live. It hasn't had any major updates gameplay-wise this year, but the Dragon Riding armor set that was data mined for the event has been confirmed to be available for the vendor in Moongate for 50 gold. So this is, you know, a little bit of a gold sinky type of thing there. And, and that's a little bit of a theme that you're going to be seeing in this news. Now, in a much bigger surprise, the Love is in the Air event went live in Monday with a complete revamp. Unlike previous holiday event revamps, which typically just added maybe one or two extra things to do, and honestly, in my opinion, were more accurately described as updates than revamps, almost the whole of this event has been changed. The old NPCs and quests have been removed to be replaced with new areas outside the gates of Stormwind and Orgrimmar. There's new NPCs and new yearly and daily quests. The only thing that remains unchanged is the old Crown Chemical Co. dungeon encounter, but even that now has a bit of a lead-in quest which I guess is to help newer players to find it. The event token acquisition is a lot more front-loaded now. You get around 150 to 160 tokens in day one, and the new quests also feel a lot more streamlined and up to the kind of more modern standards of WoW. Overall, the day one experience for the event is kind of awesome and this is very much the kind of update I'd like to see more of for the other holiday events in future. I particularly like that one of the dailies sends us off to either Grizzly Hills or Feralis. For a long time, I've been a bit sad that the WoW devs don't make more use of the old world. WoW has an absolutely immense game world, but these days most of it kind of feels pretty empty and irrelevant unless you're farming old mounts or, or you know just leveling up and all. Now I think it's probably very difficult for the dev team to justify the time it would take to make the old world all part of endgame but things like these holiday events do seem to me to be great vehicles where they can do that in a lower scale so yeah it's, it's really good to see that happening. Now while I think the event overall really is a good update they do take the day two experience doesn't feel quite as strong in my opinion. It was a little sparse feeling because you go down to only having two dailies, which really don't take long to do. Now these dailies do have quite a few variants which do rotate and that does help to kind of make it a little bit more replayable. But I would like to have seen a third daily as well, perhaps a repeatable version of that annual quest line, which sends us over to Shadowfang Keep. Maybe they could just send us over, have us like kill the bad NPCs out there and just award a smaller amount of the tokens than you do get during the starting event. It's also a bit of a shame the dungeon encounter hasn't had official refresh. Of all the holiday dungeon events, this one always feels the most dated looking to me and, and I, I don't want to see the event go away, but yeah, I, I do think that it'd be nice to see a wee bit of a refresh. But honestly, you know, when the only criticism of something like this is giving me more, that, that I think is usually a sign that the team's doing something right. Now, the one thing that isn't perfect is that there's a mechanic where we can donate gold to the Artisans Consortium. This includes an achievement for donating 50k gold. And if you drop 10k a day towards that, you get an extra 10 love tokens. Now, personally, a 10 point achievement doesn't really feel like a good reward for dropping 50k. And dropping 140k for 140 tokens is, is it's a pretty abysmal rate of exchange. So yeah, this it's an interesting idea, but it doesn't really feel good. And I think there's a lot of accusations of it being a gold sink and it's pretty hard to refute that in this case. Now on the latter point of us dropping these items, there's actually nothing in game that tells you you can get those 10 tokens for dropping 10k unless you actually either do it or read an online guide. Now, 
Secrets like the Hearthstone I just covered are a lot of fun and definitely have a place in the game, but the fun from those secrets comes from the effort of discovery or the epicness of the reward. And in this case, you know, finding that you get those extra tokens doesn't really involve much effort. But it doesn't really feel very epic either. Um, so I, I think this is actually a bit of a rare miss for the event. Um, things like this where you kind of have to be reading guides to find out about it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not really something I'm, I'm overly impressed with. But, you know, the event does also have a bunch of refreshed rewards that we've covered previously. There's a new Dragon Riding armor set that's drawn from the dungeon event. Basin reports, even though I haven't had it yet, it does seem to have a better drop rate than the, the Heartbreaker mount. There's also in the subject amounts the other new mount, the Heart Seeker Mana Ray. That's 270 of the love, love tokens. There's a new boat toy that, and and a toy that turns players into hearts, which is like kind of like the overtuned corgi goggles. Super useful when folks are blocking the NPCs, although it unfortunately doesn't remove the mounts, which means they can still use mounts to kind of grief people. And there's also one that changes the skybox. It, brings in some really lovely looking colours and works very similarly to the engineering versions which brought in storms and that only you and your group members can see it so it's not something that you're going to get annoyed by other people doing. There's also a, some new rose themed transmogs. These are headsets and the male characters hold them in their teeth and the female characters have them in their hair. So there's definitely plenty to spend all the tokens that you'll be getting when you go to try this event out. And even if you don't usually do the holiday events, I do recommend giving this a try because it has been a pretty big change. Now, with all these changes, some of the achievements for the event at that were related to the old quests that have been removed have now been moved over to being feats of strength. But this doesn't thankfully impact the main meta achievement which is part of the long strange chip achievement for the violet protoject so there's no worries there you can still go ahead and get that mount if you really want to now if you're interested in a playthrough of the new content there should be a link to my guide review video on screen now i'll also drop a link to the wowhead guide down in the comments below just in case you need a little bit of a help to get going during Dragonflight, we've become accustomed to getting the next patch on the PTR pretty much as soon as the preceding patch goes live. This pattern's now been well and truly broken with 10.26. With the only info for this patch in the roadmap being a mysterious pirate flag and the WoW team memeing on Twitter about it on what was almost a daily basis, there's always been a bit of a question if it, this patch would ever make it onto the PTR or if they would try and keep the mystery. And with each passing week, it's been looking more and more likely that we're not going to see it in the PTR. This was confirmed this week with an update from executive producer Holly Longdale. In the update, Holly confirmed that 1026 will not be on the PTR before launch. She did share that the new patch will have a unique event inspired by past musings from the community. This is going to be open to everyone with a WoW subscription from Classic or Dragonflight. Holly also told us that the patch will drop in March. Now there's no info if this patch is going to include any other features, but if you're interested in my thoughts on what could be in the patch, there should be a link to the video I did a couple of weeks ago speculating about this on screen now. Now Holly's announcement this will be open to both Classic and Dragonflight players is quite interesting to me. I've seen a few folks suggest that this might mean that there could even be versions of the event in both Classic and Dragonflight, but given the way Holly worded it as being open to players from Classic rather than including Classic and the lack of any mention of it in the Classic roadmap, I think that's not really very likely. What I think the plan probably is, is to use this as a bit of an incentive to try and get the classic players to give the modern game a try. And what's interesting is what this will mean for how the event will work. Because currently, you know, classic players can't access Dragonflight content at all without buying the expansion. 
And even if they do buy the expansion, getting to level 70, you know, does still take a bit of an effort. And I think that those factors would probably put a lot of the classic players who are not interested in the modern game in giving it a try. So what would be Blizzard's likely solution to that resistance? I actually think there's three potential options. The first is that the new event is just an instance event that they could and they'll allow us to either use a retail character or maybe like template class trial characters to access the event. They can obviously use scaling to make it work with both max level and level one cars. Now, while that scaling does work, I think when you look at time walking, I'm not sure a level ca one character would scale very well, especially if it just had one ability. So my kind of thinking is that this option is probably somewhat unlikely as I think it wouldn't give the best experience for classic or indeed for retail players. I also think this is not really a great way of promoting the game, you know, Classic players might come in and try the event, but if you're not really exposing them to the rest of the game, I'm not sure it would really sell the game to them and most likely they just drop off at the end of the event. Now option two would be just put the event in that, you know, an old world area that is available to people without a sub. That obviously does make it pretty accessible, but it doesn't really do much to sell the changes that they've brought in in Dragonflight which you know have been pretty well received. I think for a lot of classic laps players you know it would be just sending them to content they've seen before or possibly stuff like BFA and Shadowlands which is a bit of a bad rep in the community and I think overall I think it wouldn't really be do all that good job of selling it. The third option is to put Dragonflight, is to, sorry, the third option is to put it in Dragonflight and to open up Dragonflight for all. Now, usually this is something that does happen with the pre-patch for the next expansion, but I kind of feel like doing it now would be a really good way to let both classic players, but also other completely lapsed players to try the game before the next expansion. Dragonflight has had a lot of positive coverage, and I'll bet there are a bunch of folks out there that are thinking about getting into the war within, but currently plan to wait for it to come out. And, you know, reducing the cost of entry into the game at the moment might well be the thing that could push them over the edge to come in sooner. Now, that obviously still doesn't remove the issue of requiring them to level up to at least 60 in BFA. And again, we know BFA had that bad reputation, deserved or not. And, you know, the time getting to 70, that, that kind of friction, I think, would still put people off. But what if this is also the time they decide to make Dragonflight the default 10 to 70 leveling experience and to do something similar to what they did at the start of Dragonflight, which is they made the, the whole 10 to 60 just be a little bit faster, so it was about the same speed as the 10 to 50 used to be in Shadowlands. Dragonflight, you know, it's got a much better reputation and I think this might make it a more attractive proposition, um, especially if they allowed the new event to scale from level 10 because, you know, that run through Exile's Reach really doesn't take long at all, so it'd be pretty real friction to get people into the game, maybe into the event, and then maybe say, ah, you know what, while I'm here, I might as well get it up to level 70. Now, overall, I think if the goal is to demo the modern game to classic players, option three really would be the one I think they should go with, but that's obviously going to significantly change leveling for the rest of us a lot earlier than we'd be expected. It might turn it into a really good time to level up a few extra characters for the world within. Now what's really interesting about this is there's also been some data mining that suggested they're working in some open world changes to Pandaria questing, potentially bringing into the questing experience like the, the later patch stuff, things like the Isle of Thunder, Timeless Isle and all that. Now that's most likely part of the Pandemonium event that they've mentioned and for 10 to 7 but i wonder you know is that pandemonium stuff itself a bit of trial for revamping the old expansion leveling to make them kind of flow better for us and i think you know this is all signs that they might be up to something that's a little bit interesting and i'm certainly going to be looking forward to seeing what that is but anyway what do you all think is going on here if you've got your own thoughts or 
about how we could solve this mystery or interesting bits of speculation, do feel free to share it in the comments below. I always love to speculate about the game and I always love to see other people's speculation as well. Now, something else I've seen discussed by the community is the question of the stage releases for WoW. You know the way that in the US, uh, new patches drop on the Tuesday, in the EU, we get them drop on the Wednesday. And the fact is that if they go ahead with that this event, it's going to make the event really only be a surprise for the US. Now, I think that's a very valid criticism, honestly. It, right now, it is definitely Blizzard that stops us getting into the content in the EU at the same time as the US. But in practice, you know, I'm, I'm not actually sure a global release would actually make much change. If this release was to happen at the same time as a patch launch, uh, it, as timing wise that would mean for us in the EU it would be midnight it's come out and, and I don't know about you but I'd not be staying up late for just an ordinary patch so in practice I'm going to be getting the content at the same time on Wednesday I'd be getting it anyway so just my little thoughts is I, I don't really think these global releases would really have the impact that I think that we sometimes assume it be. Now, Classic does come out at 9pm UK and that would give a lot of people in the US a little bit of time. But when I look at how often the US like live game patch releases overrun, I'm not sure how feasible it would be for the team. And honestly, I also think that trying to release the retail game in all three regions at once would put a pretty heavy load in the engineering team. It, it's a nice idea, but I have a feeling the benefits would really be worth the pain it would cause for the dev team or indeed the light increased likelihood of issues that we'd get with putting them under that pressure so i i personally think that probably they're not that likely to do it but you know yeah as, as i said I, I don't think it would make all that much of a difference anyway but you know if you have other thoughts feel free to disagree in the comments below now i personally think the team is taking a bit of a risk with this approach by making it a surprise the combination of secrecy and memeing from developers have building up a lot of anticipation and expectation amongst the more engaged part of the player base and if they don't deliver something that's at least close to those expectations they're going to be in for a bit of a roasting not to mention risking a loss of player trust now this is always an issue when it comes to hyping things up. If you set high expectations, you're making it much harder to meet those expectations. And while I'd like to think Blizzard knows better, developers do sometimes get a little too close to the designs, which means they're not really the best judge of how things are going to land with players. And of course, you know, marketers, they're always known for overhyping things that don't deserve it. The lack of PTR testing, I think, also adds a lot of technical risk to this. Quite a few of the Dragonflight patches have had bugs in the main headline features. I mean, just you just need to remember the trading post, which had to be shut down but a couple of hours after it went live. And all these issues in the patches really don't serve to earn trust. I think even with a PTR, and, and Holly, you know, did acknowledge an announcement that she thought there could be bumps. I just hope these don't, bumps don't result in the team having to crunch their way through a load of issues or getting something out that's broken enough that, again, it just serves to disappoint players. Anyway, time will tell in all of that. Now, that's not the only info we got. Holly also revealed that the 1026 will have the data for Season 4 in it and that soon after it comes out, it will go up in the PTR so that we can test Season 4. Now, I don't think that means Season 4 will launch very fast after 1026. You know, in Shadowlands, there was a delay of almost three months between 925 and Season 4. Now, I don't think it will be that long of a wait this time but i'm still not expecting us to see season four until late april or the start of may so i encourage you all to just kind of manage your expectations appropriately on that front now holly also reconfirmed the team's commitment to the roadmap and shared some of the principles they're aiming for uh, which I think are really interesting. So the principles were continue to evolve the living world for all players. Now, 
I, I don't think at the moment we can really call Azeroth a living world, but I'd really like the idea of it becoming that. So hopefully that's something that they will be leaning more and more into. And she did say in that point that they're going to build on the learnings from 2023 to deliver content regularly for Dragonflight and Classic, update and modernize our experience and quality of life in all flavors about, and listen to our feedback and keep improvement. Um, the second point was to deliver the first installment of their most ambitious story within The War Within. World of Warcraft The War Within is preparing to invite players for testing in the coming months and they're working hard to deliver the epic journey of their world so saga. The other thing they've committed to is to try new things, take risks and to bring us new experiences. Our development team is trying new approaches, invention and creativity are critical to this ever evolving world of Azor that we craft for and with all of you. Now th these sound really really good as a guiding principle and I'm very much hoping that able to deliver in the last few patches and into the war within. Overall or well, what Holly's sharing is creating a very optimistic picture for WoW in my view. This is probably the most positive I've felt about the game as a whole since Legion. And that does seem to be reflected in the community and even by the WoW devs who have certainly been engaging with the community a lot more than I've ever seen. If you're somebody you know who's wondering should you come back to World of Warcraft, um, I'd certainly say it'd be worth giving the war within a try. Um, honestly, Dragonflight's a pretty decent expansion. It's not a bad time to come back, but you know, it's it's not perfect. And at this end of the game, there's, it's a slightly overwhelming experience if you do come in. But certainly, if that's some you played well a lot in the past, you you'll probably be used to those type of experiences as well. So yeah, if you feel like it's worth you fancy coming back just now i think it's a decent time but definitely if you're really thinking about the war within i i think it's very likely it's going to be a good one although i would personally recommend holding off pre-ordering until we see the alpha and the beta because you know you never know and I, I, honestly i think that pre-ordering kind of enables large video com game companies to kind of get away with a bit of like not very good stuff at the times so i'm not saying i think the team's going to do that because i don't think they're going to do that but yeah i, I think from a consumer point of view pulled off in the pre-orders but definitely you know have, think seriously about coming back when the time comes anyways on to other bits of news so the hall of fame for amir de Salt raid finally filled last weekend with 200 guilds having defeated Farak on mythic difficulty congratulations to everyone involved this does mean that with the reset this week x realm mythic opened up which means you'll likely see more groups in the group finder for Mythic if you don't have a guild. This at the same time as is pretty transitional, also accompanied by uh, some pretty hefty nerfs to Farak, which will likely speed up the rate of kills somewhat. So I suspect we'll get to 300 a lot faster than we got the first 100 or the second 100 burn through. Now, Holly's update didn't completely leave Classic without any news. Um, her update did come with an updated roadmap, which indicated that the Cataclysm Beta is being launched after the Classic Cell Found Mode in February, rather than before that came out. This honestly isn't a massive change, and it might just reflect an earlier than planned launch for Solo Cell Found. Classic also got a little surprise with the launch of the leveling buff, which is 50% for characters under 25 at the reset. This was originally announced for phase two, but it arrived as a little early present, which should make it easier for newer players to catch up in SOD. Now, in Thursday, the team also released previews for four more of the hero talent sets. These were Keeper of the Grove, for Balance and Restoration Druid, Dark Ranger for Beast Mastery and Marksmanship Hunter, Frost Fire for Fire and Frost Mage, and Oracle for Holy and Disciplined Priest. 
Now, of these options, the Dark Ranger is probably the one that stands out for me. I know this is a class fantasy for many hunters, albeit I'm not sure if the hero, ta hero talents will offer the kind of cosmetic changes that Dark Rangers fans would look for. I know there's been quite a few people in the community that have been calling for the idea of class skins, and these hero talents, they're, they're definitely not that. They're definitely a lot more calmed down. Now, I might do some videos diving into a few classes later on but I'm planning to kind of leave that until we've got a more complete picture of the options available for the classes but if you haven't seen the updates yet I'm going to include some links to the Blizzard announcement down below. Blizzard have said that they're issuing these previews early to get feedback so if you do have thoughts I do encourage you to pop over to the WoW forums and have your say and get that feedback in before it becomes too late for the team to act in the feedback. Um, I mean, I'm sure that over the coming weeks and months we'll see a lot more of these updates. I suspect the team are planning to push them out piecemeal as they get things ready to share which you know does help them get earlier feedback for the ones that they're further ahead on. Anyways, that's all of the updates for a week that was actually turned out to be surprisingly packed with news. If you've got any thoughts or feedback about the, the news in here, I certainly encourage you to add it in the comments below. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to catch up on some of my other videos as soon as they go live, do hit that subscribe button and then the bell icon so that you get the notifications. And if you've liked this video in particular, do let me know and let the YouTube algorithm know by smashing that like button. Anyways, that's all I have for this week. So thanks for taking the time to listen along and I shall see you all soon.